Thank you, Shana. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Happy Mother's Day. That's such a powerful poem by your friend, um, Christiana. And wow, what a powerful woman reading it as well. Happy Sunday, everybody. It's so fun to always gather. I love looking around, looking at your faces. You guys are a gift. And it's fun to honor all everyone, but even our single mothers. Thank you for standing and letting us love on you and support you. And it's fun to see friends that are visiting. We have a really big week coming um, up. Our daughter is getting married on Thursday. Yep, yep. So my family in this section that I've all flown in, will you guys stand real quick? If you're my family, stand on up. Isn't this so fun? Yay. Thank you, guys. It's really fun for us because leaving, and well, many of you guys have done this, you leave one location and you just go by yourselves and your dream would be like, maybe one day our family will come at minimal, just visit, but it's so nice, it's a treat to have everyone coming. The biggest thing, if you wanna pray for us this week, is that we have the ability to be present with everybody at the same time. I know like we're not the Lord, the omnipresence, but like in each conversation to be present because it's a dream to have everyone coming in. And we are very excited to be hosting this wedding in Greenville, really fun. So good to see you guys. I wanna um, just take a moment, I have some funnies to start with. We were serious um, about our poem and honoring women. Now I just have some other funny parent um, things about Mother's Day. You know, Mother's Day, um, it's always fun to honor each other. So each, each of the days, like I wanna honor our moms all the time, but I love to be intentional and um, just honor. Motherhood is all I know it to be, it's about giving. <laughs> From the time that life begins to grow inside of you, your body gives. Your body gives the best of what you have for another human being. And then they're born and you give what you have. It's nurturing. It's changing your life and schedule. It's uh, giving of your time, attention, even your sleep. It's just constant giving. And what I baffle at in being a mom is in the beginning, it's a challenge, at least for me. It was an adjustment because you don't have to take care of another human being. At least and I wasn't in that situation. I had an animal, dog, maybe some siblings. But it's not the same kind of relationship when they're your child. And um, it was shocking adjustment for me. And... <laughs> You know, you get used to it, and then I think it's so interesting, and then they grow up, and then you have to adjust to, now you get to go, and now, wait, come back, I liked this adjustment. And so it's just, so, motherhood is about adjusting, it's about giving always, and um, preferring another human being, and it's such a gift. And so I just want to honor all the moms in this room, all the grandmas, and just thank you for all that you do, as well as moms who mother other people. Sometimes it's not even your own biological children. I have been mothered by lots of people, and I'm so thankful for just the heart to nurture and the heart to give that um, so many women carry. I have a funny quote um, that I want to share with you. It says, once upon a time, I was a perfect parent. Then I had children, the end. <laughs> That's a happy Mother's Day quote, you know? <laughs> you know how, like, you are the master of so many things until you... Um, actually have to do it. People who have a lot of opinions about parenting have a lot more before they do it. Okay, so you know you're a mom when. Number one, you do more in seven minutes than most people do all day. <laughs> Number two, going to the grocery store by yourself is a vacation. <laughs> You've been there. Instead of running from projectile vomit, you run towards it. Uh-huh. I have stories right now. You think of physical pain on three levels. Pain, excruciating pain, and stepping on a Lego. <laughs> Number five. You have the ability to hear a sneeze, cough, through closed doors in the middle of the night, two bedrooms away while your husband snores next to you. That baffles me. I have had this experience, and I go because they cough. Is everything okay? And I walk back in the room, and I'm like, how in the world do I even sleep in this? How did I, not that my husband snores that loud. He just snores really loud. It's real. It's real. And number six, peeing with an audience is part of your daily routine. A 15-minute shower with the door locked feels like a day at the spa. Number eight, you've been washing the same load of laundry for three days because you forgot to dry it. See, you laugh. You've been there. 
you can't remember what the words personal space mean. Mm -hmm. And number 10, you have several storybooks memorized. I still have them right now. Oh, the things you can think, if only you try. I mean, there's the books you keep reading. And number 11, your love is so ferocious it scares you sometimes. Motherhood. There's so many fun things as we grow, we give, we learn, and things just get wider and deeper inside of us, and it costs us greatly, and, th and it's also extremely beautiful. So what a gift. So thank you, moms. Thank you, grandmothers. Thank you, great-grandmothers, for who you are and all that you give. And I want to remind everyone to call your mom, to send a little note, tell them how much you love them and appreciate them, and they most likely weren't perfect, um, but they probably did something for you at minimal giving you life. Um, and there's probably other people in your life who have mothered you. So my encouragement is to um, thank, take a moment to thank those who have fiercely loved us today. Um, so we honor all of you guys. I'd love to start off today. Um, we'll be reading, I want to read Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 follows Hebrews 11, which is the big faith chapter. It starts off with describing faith, and then it talks about different heroes of the faith. Number 12 starts with, um, this, these two verses. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get going. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your truth. And I invite you right here, Lord, right in the middle of what we're doing, right in the middle of our heart, right in the middle of our story. God, and I thank you for your grace and mercy today. Lord, I pray that you open up our eyes. God, and I pray for the grace and courage to be present with you. Yeah, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So there's a lot of parts to this. Um, as I look at this scripture... You know, surrounded by such a great class of witness, there is, he's referring to chapter 11. You're hearing Moses, Enoch, Abraham, uh, Sarah, different people who made choices. And even some of the stories don't feel so full of faith to me. And I'm like, oh, the Lord calls that faith? I like that. I have a chance. I have a chance. But it's such a great cloud of witness means there is a lot. There is a lot of people that have gone before us, and it's their stories, their yeses that inspire us and encourage us and are cheering us on. And then after that it says, and lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So we know that we're moving from one place to another, and we know that there's sin, things that separate us from God, and that we don't want those um, to ensnare us. But it also says there's other things. There's weight. I wonder what that weight could be. What is weight that would keep us in this race and hold us back? That could not be sin, maybe. Could it be discouragement? Or could there be aspects of distraction in our lives? And um, I just pray as we're talking that the Lord would show us if there are things that are weighing us down in this race. Because it says we run a race with endurance, the race that is set before us. And how many of you have um, ever ran races before? Some. How many of you wish you could run races? You're like, no. <laughs> and um, any long-distance runners in here? Okay, so there's different kinds of races and runs. You have the sprints, you have some middle distance, and then you have the long ones. And long is relative. You know, I've seen the... Um, I mean, some people have done um, marathons, 26 miles, but then I've seen like the ultras, the 50 miles plus. Anyone did those? Those are the crazy people in life, no? Okay, good, because I just called you names. Okay. So, <laughs> good, you're not in this room. But there's all different kinds of, um, of races, and uh, the race that this uh, is talking about, there's a the word endurance. And endurance, um, in this, in the, he in the Greek, it says it's, Hoop, uh, I got this word, hoopamone, hoopamone is the Greek word. And it's a word for, it says steadfast, consistency, endurance, patience, enduring, sustaining, perseverance. Patient, again, steadfast, waiting for, and I love this uh, definition, quality of character that does not allow one to surrender. So there's a race that we're in, and it's referring to our life, and it's not a short race. 
If we're alive and we're breathing, we've been baby six weeks old over here, but everybody else, I mean, we're in this for the long haul, and um, there is a life, a destiny, a calling on our lives, and um, in Hebrews it says, and let us run with endurance, and so that's a really hefty word, and um, so different kinds of races. I ran long distance I don't know, probably from like, I think my first race was in fifth grade. And I'm like, this is kind of fun. So I don't know why you call it fun, but something about me liked it. So I did a lot more of them. And in, in races, there's all different parts. You have the beginning. And in the beginning, you know, everyone has their own strategy depending on who you are and maybe where your strengths lie. Um, and then there's different um, the courses, terrain, they affect you greatly as well. I remember in high school, I ran uh, cross country. We did three mile races. And one of them was in Fort Bragg, California, and it started on the beach in the sand that was not wet. Do you know what that's like? I'm going somewhere. And so what it does, it just wastes all your energy because at the beginning, so you have to strategize. Do I run as fast as I can and try to get in front of everybody? And then will I be done after like 50 feet? Um, or do you just um, hang tight and just keep your pace and get going once you hit the trail? So that was Fort Bragg. They had another race. And the terrain was very different. It was behind Humboldt State University. It's right where the mountains come down by the ocean. And they had a, a nice mountain hill behind it. I think it would definitely be a mountain here. Um, and it was a three-mile run. And it's a mile up like one mile going straight up, a mile around the top and a mile down. And you go, okay, so now that I'm going to run this run, what is my strategy? My strategy was just put your hands on your knees and keep running because if you're going up, your knees are right there. <laughs> and lock your arms and then you can use all your body. <laughs> um, but um, the course of the race really determines a lot of the, is a big factor as well. And then the length, each mile is very different. I would call the first mile, like when you're doing a five, seven mile, 10 mile run, the first mile is just the yucky mile for me. It's you just getting in, you kind of like, oh, my breathing feels all over the place. You have to just kind of learn to settle in. And then you start going to the second mile, the third mile, and then you just get, go to fun places. See, if you just keep running, it gets better. It gets better. And a lot of it really depends, too, when you're running a long race, knowing yourself physically, where your strengths are. For me, the longer it would go, mind you, I haven't ran more than 13, 14 miles. But I can do better at four miles than I do at one mile. I, it's just for me. So, so endurance is definitely a strength of mine. But I had a friend. Her name was uh, Julie Bohr, and we would run together in high school, junior high and high school, and Julie and I could keep great pace together. I'm really good at pacing with people. So if I run with you, then if you do really good, I could do really good because I could stay with you. Until, and I would do that with Julie until the end because a big part of the race, too, is finishing and finishing. And then and there's a, something called, like, the kick. At the end, you want to kick it because if you're going to win a race, you have to get in front of people. So you have to keep something in you so you could get up there. And I had a kick, but Julie had a long kick. So we would run and we could keep pace and it was all really fun. And then, you know, it would just be really far in sight. And I could just tell, I would say, go, Julie, go win them all. <laughs> I'll be right behind you. And I had a kick, but I, I couldn't keep it as long as her. But something else happens in running as well. And it, because we're doing something for a sustained period of time, sometimes there's this point that you get exhausted. You get exhausted, you have a hard time breathing. And then what do you do when that happens? And it's called, sometimes I call it the wall. You hit the wall. You're like, I'm running, but like either my diaphragm is seizing up or you're getting cramps or, you know, something is cramping on your body. <laughs> and, um, and if you keep running, they, there's a terminology that they call the second wind. The second wind is a phenomenon in an endurance sports such as marathons or road running as well as other sports whereby an athlete who is out of breath and too tired to continue knowing as hitting the wall suddenly finds the strength to press on at top performance with less exertion. This is actually a physical thing that happens when you are pushing your body to the limits for an extended period of time. And today what's been on my heart is I feel, I feel the Lord is inviting us into refreshing 
strengthening and encouraging, that there is a level of endurance that's being required of, required of us, that I see some that are growing weary. I see some that their legs are tired. And there's circumstances. There's big decisions that need to be made. There's unknown things. It's not like you're crazy for feeling this way. There's actual reasons that there's exhaustion beginning to set in. And I feel like the Lord wants to give us a second win today. And that's what, when he's a provider, he can do whatever he wants. And do you know that when we ask him, he loves to give good gifts. And so on my heart today was to see people get breakthrough. And that as we come to church and as we are putting one foot in front of the other, see the thing is you, we wouldn't get a second wind if you actually stop running. There is something about this. Like you could stop but you're actually not going to get where you're supposed to go. See, we are on a race, and it is a long race. And I just know for many of us have transitioned, and even in transition is vulnerable. You know, I, I feel like I get decision fatigue in transition. I know we moved here. I don't even know how many zip codes we had all at once, um, four, three or four. We had like a P.O. box, an apartment, and we had a storage unit, and then we got the office. And it was like, which one was this credit card attached to? Which one was the mailing address? Which, like you just, so many things that come up. And um, I feel like today that, um, that the Lord wants to come in and refresh and strengthen us in that place. Because going on in life, saying yes to the Lord doesn't mean things, that things get less. It doesn't mean they get easier. And I would say that with blessing, how many people want more blessing in their life? Like, I want, yes, Lord, give me all that I have. But what I've learned, that with more blessing, there's more responsibility. And it requires more of us. And so with all of that, I'm like, oh, we need actually more of the Lord. And I want to share a testimony. As I was listening to different um, things this week, I'm just reminded of the things that God has done in our lives that just bring encouragement and strength to me. And I always think, like, if the Lord can do it once, he can do it again. And I love it at the, at the Christian school at Bethel when they share a testimony. They say, kids, what do we say now? And they say, do it again, God, do it again. They share testimonies like, God gave us a refrigerator this week. Do it again, God, do it again. And so I just want to share this testimony. Um, A few years ago, actually it was in 2016, we um, decided that we wanted to move and buy a house. And I've shared this story before, but I know there's so many people that are looking for jobs and for houses and for things that you don't know where they're going to come from. And in those places, God always does stuff in here in us. And in this journey, we knew it was time to move. And we had a really beautiful house. Our girls were um, just starting high school, and it was just a great season. And in Reading, we lived, it was just really hot. Like, this is hot and a little humid, but like Reading is, can get like 20 degrees, 30 degrees even hotter than this. Um, it's just very warm. And as they were getting older, we we always wanted to move to a place where had a pool because as you have kids and you want them to hang at your house and you want their friends to come over, you should have a pool. And um, so I'm like, we want a pool. The only thing is, the kicker was, we bought in 2005, we moved to Reading from Weaverville, 2005 at the peak of the market. And so we bought this house and it was a beautiful house. It was for the most expensive price that um, it never came back to the price we bought it for. And so as we were going, I know we're not supposed to be here. It's actually time for our family to move somewhere else. We could not figure out financially how to make that move. And so finally one day, and we had done this for years, looked at houses, but we're like, gosh, we know we have to sell this house, you know, looking at all the stuff. So we said, finally, we're just going to move. We're going to move because we know it's time for us to move. And so we put our house on the market. I know God has a, a better house for us. I know there's a house with a pool. I mean, we were so full of faith that God just had a house for us. And we knew what the timing would be. We knew what it would look like. And um, so we put our house on the market and began to look for houses. It was exciting looking for houses, kind of and kind of not. So we knew we wanted property. We knew we wanted it on a certain closer to their school. We knew that we wanted a pool. Those were the things. And there was a certain price range we were looking at. And um, we had to make a contingent offer until we sold our house. We go and look at houses. And um, the first house we go and look at, we go down this road. It's called Whispering Oaks. Doesn't that sound nice? 
Whispering Oaks was the road you had to go down. We go down to Whispering Oaks. Eric and I have separate cars. We go to the house, and I was already like a little, a little apprehensive because the house was above our price range. But I'm like, I'll go look at it. You know, what's the harm in doing that? So we go look at it, and you know when you're with a realtor, I think the people who owned it were there as well or were renting it. So we're looking around, not really talking, only with your eyes at each other, you know. And, um, and they said, uh, so we get done, and I am discouraged. I'm like, this is overpriced. There was no pool, and it was, um, there was rot under the windows. There was things that was like, this is overpriced, and it needs money in it. So, but I'm not talking out loud to Eric because, you, you know, it's not really appropriate in that setting with everybody. So we get in the car. We kind of talk real quick, and he's like, this is great. I'm like, this is not great. <laughs> and, um, and so we, um, I get in my own car, and I'm like, God, I can actually afford the house that I live in. What am I doing? Oh, no, I'm doing it to myself, too. And um, I get in the car, and I just am kind of like, Lord, um, what kind of, I don't want to live in a house like that. I do not think that is, that is not what I'm praying for and I want. And I'm driving away, and I'm looking around and talking to God. I look over at this house on Whispering Oaks, and I just it kind of wrote, the houses um, are on 10-plus acres, so they're a little ways off the road. But a house behind the bushes looked kind of nice. I'm like, that house looks nice. I'm driving. I think there's a pool back there, too. Like, couldn't there be something like that on the market, Lord? So we continue looking for houses, and it's just this journey. And it is like a roller coaster because we know what we're praying for. We know what we want. And there's only one reason that we sold our house, because we're moving forward, and it's time for a new house. So we actually, a month passes, two months passes. Our house finally sells, and we do not have a house to move into. And we did it to ourselves. And... Um, <laughs> But we really did have faith. Like, we really felt the Lord. It, we wanted it, but it felt like, no, it's actually time. And um, so it was getting closer to us having to move out of the house. And we were looking at houses, and there was nothing that felt right. And um, I think it was, like, October by this time. So the month of October, I just kept saying, I know that we're going to be in escrow by November 1st. You know, you make declarations because our words are powerful. So I am declaring and I'm praying. And, and there's other things I declared in the house. I declared, Lord, this house. Let's have communion at this house. And then it sold to somebody else. You're like, man, that didn't work. Man, like I am trying everything here. We did, huh, Eric? We had communion. Yeah, we did. Um, so it's a, it's a roller coaster. You know, you're like, what does it actually look like to stand in faith when you're believing for something? And it goes way longer than you think. And it doesn't turn out like you think. Like, how do you actually go through that? That is the journey of life. I know many of you are so full of faith. I know the kind of crazy, passionate people we have here. But I just want to say we're not in it for just a sprint. And it doesn't always turn out like we think, but he is provider God. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is full of truth. He is trustworthy. And so we're on this journey. And um, I remember it was like towards the end of October, we had a women's night at Bethel. And... Um, I remember talking to Rachel, actually. I think it might have been like October 27th or something. And she goes, hey, have you found a house yet? I'm like, no. I said, but I know we're going to be in escrow by November 1st. And um, she's like, oh, really? Okay. Um, isn't that like in a couple days? I'm like, oh, wow, it is towards the end of October. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. Um, maybe look at Airbnbs or I don't know what we're going to do. And it was getting so close. So um, October 28th, that was a Thursday night. The next day we decided we should probably start packing this house up. You know, it's not really fun to pack up when you don't know where you're going. Um, and we had, I think, a pat leaders advance coming up. So we were going to be busy. So we're like, it's our free day off. Let's go pack up. So we pack up. Uh, no, we go to um, Home Depot. Home Depot, we get boxes. We're walking out of the store. This is October 30th, guys. I might, we're going to start escrow in two days, you know. So we're going to pack up our house. And we, we have to leave our house like in a week. So we had one week to pack up all our stuff and move out. So we put ourselves in a great position. <laughs> and we didn't even have to. Um, so we're going to Home Depot, walking out. As we walk out in the parking lot, we see people that we know. And we know he's a realtor. He's not the realtor we're working with or anything. And um, he goes, hey, guys, good to see you. You're buying boxes? Yeah, yeah. It was just a cart full of boxes. Are you guys moving? Yeah. Where are you moving? We don't know. Um, well, when do you have to move? In a week. Um, oh, wow. And, and then she nudges him and says, tell him about that house. 
And we're like, what house? And she goes, well, there's this house. We're not in a position to buy. But if we were, I would want this house. It needs some work, but it has a land and there's a pool. And it's on the side of the town that I wanted to live on. I'm like, great. Well, what's the address? They goes, well, we're not, it's not on the market yet. But if I find a buyer this weekend, here's the price that I can sell it for. We're like, great. Well, do you want to go look at it? Yeah, we do. Here's the address. Do you know where Whispering Oaks is? I do know where Whispering Oaks is because that was the first house we looked at that I didn't like. So I'm like, yeah, he goes, we'll go look at it right now because we have nothing better to do. And, um, and we'll let you know. So we get in our car, let's go look at the house, you know. And we're driving down Whispering Oaks. I remember this from like three months before. Oh, look at this house. Oh my gosh. It is the exact house that I looked at and said, God, couldn't there be something like that on the market? It was in our price range. It had 15 acres. It had a pool. It was everything that we were praying for. This is about God, this story. Because I tell you, I declared other houses. And I prayed for other houses. And I'm so glad I didn't get them. This was really what we wanted. And I remember walking around that property years later and just going, God, you know I trust you more than I trust myself. Like, you are so good and so faithful. And I tell you, we moved our stuff in storage. I moved, we moved in with our friend for like five or six weeks because we didn't have a house. Because the timing didn't really work out that perfect. But it was perfect, actually. It was a gift for us. So we got to, our, our daughter stayed on her living room floor. It was actually really special. And um, we moved into that house. And um, I just want to say that God is faithful, faithful. He's trustworthy, even when it doesn't turn out like what we think. Like we can't just rely, it's not only on us, and we can't put God in such a, 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 like a corner that it needs to look only like this. Even the Israelites, as God delivered them out of bondage, when they are like, we wish we could go back into bondage so that we could not just eat manna. We had better food. It is human nature sometimes to resist what God does when it doesn't look like what we think. And we're in it for the long haul. And so I'm speaking to us who have been journeying for a long time and have specific things that we're believing for. And Ian, maybe you're in a spot where you're like, I'm growing weary. I'm getting a little tired. And Jeffrey, would you come up? I would love to um, do a little bit of ministry. I want to read James 1, 2 through 4 real quick. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, not knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Do you know what patience this is? It's the hoopa um, Monet, Monet, yeah, hoopa Monet. It's the same one that's endurance, it's perseverance. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, mature, la um, complete, lacking nothing. Do you know that God, that's that Romans 8, he uses it all for our good. Every circumstance, every situation, even if you're not having fun. Even if you're on a roller coaster and you're going, this is not what I signed up for. I have to move my stuff in storage, that's going to be more work. And it's going to be okay. God is trustworthy. He is faithful. And so today I want to bring courage and I want to bring hope right where we're at. I do believe that God wants to break through, break through. Um, and I want to read, there's a commentary on the word patience, um, that same word. Patience can be read as passive, meaning that one is merely waiting uh, something out. But the Greek word here, uh, hupomone, indicates activity rather than passivity. The person is not just waiting for something to happen, though he is patient in what he is going through. There is a steadfastness that the Lord is developing inside of us, and we get it when we go through things. It's one thing to hear the stories of Hebrews 11 of what people said yes to. It's another one to be that person and be like, whoa, this is getting a lot. But I believe the Lord wants to give you a second wind today. If you are here and you're like, gosh, I want a second wind today. I would love that hope and that strength that you're talking about. That level of perseverance and the level of endurance that God wants to give us. Because what he has for us, we actually need that. We need to be a people who can go in it but still stand. And still stand even when it's like, this is not what I thought. But it's going to be okay. He doesn't change who he is just because it doesn't look like what we think. So if you're in here and you're saying, gosh, I am believing the Lord and I'm doing the best I can, but I would say, yes, I have grown weary and I would love some prayer today. If that is you, I'd love for you to stand because we are going to pray for you. We are going to see hope rise in this room. We're going to see situations change 
And you know where it's going to change first? It's going to change right inside of you. It's going to be a place, it's going to be a heart shift. Maybe there's jobs you're looking for. Maybe you're going, gosh, I moved here and this is not what I thought. Or I said yes to the Lord and it is not turning out what I, what I thought and what I was dreaming of. I just want to say it's not over yet. It's one thing to be right in the middle. You haven't finished yet. And God's not done yet. And he doesn't change who he is. If you're standing or just sitting around someone standing, I would love every single person who's standing to have a hand on them. This is the beauty of being in church is you're not alone. We have people all around here. And I want you to activate faith today. Faith is actually believing. Believing the Lord and what comes with believing, it starts, it's actually knowing God, knowing who the Lord is. So we're just gonna declare who the Lord is over our friends that are standing. God, that you are our hope, God. Thank you, Lord, for, for that you're the Prince of Peace. Right now, I invite peace into every person that is standing right now. God, and I pray for a peace that brings clarity, a clarity and um, eyes to be able to see you, that you would be, um, yeah, the center of our focus. And I pray for everyone who's standing. If there's weight and things that have entangled them, I break them off right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray, God, that you'd give them eyes to see what they have entertained or partnered with that are not from you. Yeah, and right now we stand and we just declare a hope and a future. And I gotta ask for that second wind as they continue in this race. And I say continue in this race that we're not stopping, that we stand with them and we just declare life, we declare strength. Lord, and I just thank you right now for your provision, that your provision inside their heart, inside their mind, inside their body. God, and I pray, Lord, that you would show yourself true to them. Show yourself as the Prince of Peace, as the healer, as Jehovah Jireh. I thank you, God, for testimonies. God, that today would be a heart shift but even in the physical, Lord, whatever they're at on the journey, God, that you'd give them the ability to breathe deep while they still continue. Yeah, I pray that you would place them in a different place today. Yeah, I bless my friends. I bless you. I call you highly favored. I pray that the Lord would paint a target over you and that favor would be drawn to you. Yeah, thank you, God, for your favor. Thank you for life. Yeah, so we bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, why don't you just um, give them a hug real quick. Give everyone who stood needs a hug. Physical touch is important. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And then if we could just stand, if you feel comfortable holding hands, if you want to grab the hand, if you're not, just grab, put your elbow on them. I don't want to make you do anything you don't feel comfortable. But I love that we get to be together. And I just want to pray as we close. God, I thank you for everyone that we're standing in this room with, that we're holding hands with, that we're standing next to, beside and in front. God, I pray a blessing over this house. God, we thank you for your mercy, that your mercies are new every morning. I thank you for just the blessing of being your children. Yeah, we just surrender ourselves anew and afresh to you. Yeah, we have tender hearts for you, God, and we say yes to everything that you have for us. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for this day. I bless. I bless this house. I bless every heart. Yeah, to be full of you. Yeah, so God, give us the courage and the capacity to receive all that you have for us today. Yeah, we just take it all in, Lord. We will eat what you're providing. Yeah, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. If you are a home leader here um, or home pastor, we would love to ask you to come over to my right-hand side before everyone leaves. We would love to offer prayer. So if you're here and you would like more prayer for anything, we would love to pray for you. You can make your way to my right-hand side and um, get prayer. Other than that, have an incredible day. Bless you guys, and we will see you later.